Mitchell. Um, thank you again for having me today. Um, all right, so um, President Trump tweeted Tuesday night that he will sign an executive order temporarily suspending the issuance of green cards for actually an unspecified period of time, uh, rumored now to be 60 days, and saying it's needed to protect American jobs amid the impact of the COVID pandemic. Um, at this point, uh, please keep in mind this is a tweet as we know it. The White House has not released the executive order and it's unclear when exactly it will be signed. Um, when it becomes available, of course, uh, our office as well as many other <laughs> uh, very prominent uh, experts will be reviewing it and then continuing to provide updates about its scope and effect and how it might possibly affect our clients and those that we're consulting with. Um, however, we at the same time, we have heard that the, e the EO, the executive order, is actually currently being drafted. So um, it, we don't believe that it's an idle tweet, that it will, it will end up in a draft, um, at least at, the, at this point. Um, earlier drafts we have heard of the executive order would have suspended the issuance of new working visas, but now it has been reported and we are learning um, that the Trump, Trump administration ultimately decided against doing so after a lot of pushback from business groups um, that rely on foreign workers, especially in the tech sector. Uh, we also know that the essential support workers would be exempted, um, healthcare workers and agricultural workers, namely. Um, so this um, rumored or apparent um, intended uh, suspension of green cards by the Trump administration, um, uh, if in fact this EO comes into fruition, would apply for green cards um, that are employment-based is what we've heard. Um, not applicable to those green cards processing for immediate family members, children's, children and spouses um, included in that. Um, so that's important to, to note. To get an idea of how many people um, are affected or could be affected um, uh, in, uh, from October 2018 until October 2019, 577,000 immigrants granted to give you an idea. Um, so um, we also believe that before the end of the week, we will likely know the exact specifics of this EO and it will be apparently fully drafted by then. Um, and we, our hope as immigration experts is that it will not have an impact on pending applications, only new applications um, so that there wouldn't be any sort of retroactive um, penalties to those that have been already filed. And case um, history in terms of immigration processing would suggest that hopefully that would not be the case. Um, it, this is also believed to be really a political maneuver um, with the upcoming election and also how poorly the US administration has um, been in terms of preparedness and managing the challenges of COVID there has been a great deal of fear mongering about immigration right now. And um, we would expect that if this executive order is even issued, it would be met with enormous, um, significant litigation. Um, and only Congress really has the authority to stop all immigration according to the main immigration law, which is what we call the Immigration and Nationality Act. We are hopeful that a court would also issue a temporary restraining order promptly to put any order on hold until a judge has a full opportunity to determine whether this is even legal or not. Um, our office is closely monitoring the situation, of course. Um, until there is an official executive order, please keep in mind these are tweets at this time, and it does not affect any um, currently USCIS um, accepting or processing cases. So the internal service centers right now are fully operational except for the expedited service. So the normal processing of cases is st still occurring and this is for working permits and green cards um, inclusive of that. Um, we are also seeing a great deal of compassion actually um, in our filing of cases. We are seeing a lot of approvals coming out, um, which is very encouraging. Um, there's no um, 
we are thinking that if this EO does, um, you know, become fully drafted by the end of the week, and we are seeing the details of it come out, that we could expect that maybe the impact would be mostly to H-1B filings, as, and as I've mentioned, employment-based green card applications. Um, any restrictions we also feel would be temporary, again, um, rumored to be 60 days um, or a little bit more than that, and would likely, again, be challenged in court and potentially take months and months to even enforce. So we should have a heads up before anything just suddenly happens. Um, and I would also note that President Trump really has a history of making politically inspired statements that really do not have any impact on actual policy. Um, until we see the changes in policy, they do not have any bearing, again, on USCIS processing as of this moment. Um, so I would say it's still prudent at this point to move forward um, with your cases. Um, however, um, there could be case by case situations and circumstances that you would want to be speaking with an immigration um, counsel like ourselves be happy to um, consult with your situation and and advise accordingly um, i will also mention um, which is very important um, outside of this tweet um, and um, the potential EO that could be coming out of it, um, <clears throat> that travel to the United States right now for more, most countries is temporarily suspended. Um, um, there, um, if you've spent, if a person has spent any time in the last 14 days um, in, for example, China, Iran, UK, Ireland, and the Schengen area of Europe, Portugal through to Eastern European countries, um, including Hungary, Latvia, Nor Norway. Um, unfortunately, um, those individuals are not currently allowed into the United States. Um, also, I would mention that for those that are inside the United States right now, but obviously may not be green card holders or United States citizens, um, and may be here as visitors on ESTA and visa waiver, um, which of course is the uh, program which allows citizens typically from Schengen countries that have very low levels of people coming into the United States typically, um, there are usually um, are, are given a 90 day period of time to come into the United States and be tourists or take in business meetings. Um, but there are typically very strict rules around the departure for those that have um, ESTA or visa waiver and entering the country and have to leave promptly um, before the 90 days expire. And normally the violation is extremely severe if you go over that, um, being deported immediately and then never being able to use ESTA or visa waiver program again. Um, now, what's quite interesting is there has been some uh, compassion extended to um, those that are currently in the United States and um, the Trump administration has permitted uh, what's called the satisfactory departure rule, which means that a person that is here on ESTA, if in an emergency and feeling unsafe to leave, um, can then apply, make an application, um, which we are currently doing and have done for, um, uh, for clients that are on ESTA right now to get an extension um, of 90, uh, sorry, of 30 days at a time. So at first it was only released that 30 days would be given, but now we know that in fact re a renewal is being permitted as well. So additional time as well to that 30 days. So um, this is wonderful news <laughs> um, as many of you may be attempting to purchase tickets um, to potentially you know, go back to your home country or wherever, you know, um, you may be going and experiencing issues with um, actually securing that flight. Um, so in fact, that canceled flight is part of the evidence used um, in the application based on the satisfactory departure rule to obtain an extension. So um, I personally have been putting together these applications myself and it's quite involved, um, a lot of correspondence with officers um, and um, meticulous um, uh, discussion of country conditions and any other circumstances that um, may contribute to a person feeling unsafe to travel. Um, but the good news is, is that the cases at least with our office, are getting approved. So this is a great sign. Um, I would also mention that, um, it, so 
anyway, so in terms of ESTA, if you have any questions on that, please feel free to reach out to our office. Myself and Stephanie are really happy to help. Um, I also want to mention that USCIS has closed all public facing offices at this time. That would include all biometrics appointments if you are in the process um, to, or if you are pending to have your appointment. Um, the, again, as I mentioned earlier, the service centers are still operating though. So that would be for all non-immigrant visas and green cards at this time, um, uh, not, uh, not counting the impact potentially of any EO. Um, so um, I would say, mention as well an important um, other um, point is if you are currently on an H-1B and you have adjusted to working life at home and are no longer working in your office space uh, that you would that you that your employer has listed on the LCA, um, which is of course a very important component of your H-1B filing um, and, and reported on your H-1B of where your workplace is. Now the transition to um, working from home is a different location of work. And it may be important to notify, um, uh, make a notification to USCIS of this change in um, your location of work. So this is also something that um, you should be discussing with Immigration Council as well. Um, amendments are being made to H-1B and also being made to LCA based on um, the relocation um, of workers, but it is definitely on a case by case and geographically how far away um, that your home is as per your typical place of work. Also, if there's been changes to your compensation structure, um, this is also something that would impact or have implications for an H-1B amendment um, or amendment to LCA. Um, so I would also highlight this as an important development um, in the current changes with COVID um, in the immigration system um, as well. Um, much talked about as well, I will mention is the um, uh, announcement that uh, U.S. immigration will be making an exemption to the public charge rule. Um, the public charge rule was rolled out um, obviously pri well prior to COVID and it says that um, there would be an extensive background check on people that are applying for non-immigrant visas, um, workers, spouses, everyone really and including a credit check and whether you got benefits from the government and this would also be considered obviously at the green card level too. Um, uh, there uh, is a concern that people will not get health care um, because they would be receiving a federal benefit um, during COVID. However, the government did come out and announce that if you need to get testing for COVID virus or a preventative care, even if it, even if it is paid out um, by Medicaid, that you are allowed to do so. Um, and it's not going to violate the public charge rule. Um, there has it. There has also been um, uh, some announcements around um, unemployment and gaining unemployment benefits as well um, during COVID. As for many people, um, they are not able to work as they typically would, and there has been adjust adjustments in their compensation. Um, now, um, there hasn't been a unanimous. Um, agreement on this across all immigrate all uh, sorry governmental bodies we haven't heard from the state department um, for example which um, which includes all the consulates abroad as to whether they are in agreement that people um, in this position should be able to receive um, unemployment benefits and be exempted um, we have heard um, from USAS that there that there would be an exemption, but again, not across all bodies. So we do foresee that there could be a risk here, and it could be brought up that you, if you did in fact make an application um, and you have received funds, that this could come up in an interview for you um, down the road um, or down the road in your immigration processing. So I would keep that in mind um, and be conservative um, and definitely bring your case um, to an immigration council uh, for uh, special, you know, um, consideration and, and advice accordingly to your specific situation as well. 
Um, I also would like to mention that, um, uh, that for those of you who are students as well, that um, maybe on um, F1s and your school may have adjustments in terms of uh, whether the school is functioning now or not functioning, this is very important um, as your visa is really only valid so long as the school is open and you are attending classes. So you, you should absolutely speak also with an immigration professional or your DSO regarding, uh, regarding this if there's been an impact there for yourself. Um, I want to also mention that there has been a special um, COVID-19 category created called Special Situation in Natural Disaster. And it's a sort of a, 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 a catch-all category, if you will, um, that we've seen come up, which um, is allowing us to potentially look at um, circumstances where there could be a deadline that's not met or an extension that needs to be made and special circumstances considered due to a direct impact that COVID has had on the um, the beneficiary of that immigration benefit. So um, has there been uh, a negative consequence that's, that they've felt and could we make a special application that uh, there be an exemption for a missed deadline or a needed extension. So there are special um, considerations being cons uh, being being made here, but they have to be appropriately applied for and there is an application process as well. Um, so I would say um, just and looking at all of these um, uh, changes that I've talked about. Uh, so starting off with um, the ESTA extensions that we're seeing as well as the amendments to um, H1B, the uh, that may be necessary for people. I've also talked about um, the normal processing of cases um, with the service centers as opposed to premium processing, which has now been temporarily suspended, um, as well as we talked about the, um, uh, the uh, exemption to the public charge rule during COVID. Um, and we have also talked about um, what students should be wary of if their, um, if their uh, program has been impacted. With all of these changes, you want to be um, active, as proactive as you possibly can with how this is personally affecting you, which I can't emphasize enough, um, means that you should be seeking help from an immigration counsel so that you can be appropriately advised. Um, you know, and I would say, you know, on, on, a, on a more more of a perhaps an inspiring point, um, there for those of you that are in the U.S. and have worked hard to get to the U.S., there's a reason why obviously you are here, and. Although these circumstances that we're reading about and reports that we're hearing about may seem quite daunting, um, I would not give up and I would not feel discouraged. There are options for most things in immigration. And um, so that's why it's also important to be knowledgeable and to be informed of your options moving forward. Um, keep hold of your dreams, keep hold of your goals. and. I am sure we will be we will, we will be through this. Thanks. Merci, Lorraine. Uh, thank you, Lorraine. Um, I think we have uh, uh, another question here uh, for from from Joanna. So um, we are going to open your your mic, uh, Joanna. Uh, if you keep it brief, because uh, we have a lot of topics still to cover. Thank you very much. Uh, hello. Uh, I'm wondering specifically what would be the case for uh, O-1 visas, and especially for those who are in the renewal process, because um, I haven't applied yet, but I'm still in the process of renewing my O-1. So I was wondering what would be the case for one O-1 holders. Of course. Uh, it is uh, business as usual. You will be happy to know um, there has been no um, hindrance to applying for your renewal, but well, that's a, that's, there's a caveat here. Start early because the premium processing, which is the expedited 15-day turnaround 
for O1s has been temporarily suspended. That means that everyone is now subject to applying normal processing, which can take anywhere from three to six weeks to up to 10 months for processing. Um, I've seen even a year I've seen. So I don't know when your expiry occurs. However, you really want to keep this in mind so that um, you can have more than enough time to transition and get into um, and to not have a gap in your work authorization because simply filing your uh, your you know, your next one for, for the extension doesn't mean that it extends your work authorization. It merely extends your legal, uh, the, the legal right to be in the United States, but doesn't, but it, it, your work authorization isn't um, extended um, unless the second petition is actually approved and it should be approved before your first 001 is expired. So um, definitely the timing on that is very important. So really the takeaway is start early on that um, and so uh, and I would say that we are seeing quite good results with our renewals and it's really thankful for that because um, in the last year to three years I might say well two years um, the level of scrutiny on these renewals has gone up quite considerably um, and um, so it's nice to see um, you know, uh, a significant amount of approvals that are coming out, um, at least from our office, but you have to be quite meticulous with how you're preparing um, that renewal. And there's a lot of considerations that never went in, you know, six, you know, five years ago, we're just never even, uh, you know, um, something in practice that we saw that had to be done in order to um, be successful. But now uh, we are seeing those things. So you wanna make sure that all those are incorporated and start early. Thanks, Laurel. Uh, Lauren, sorry. We do have uh, um, another question. We can take that, uh, that, that question uh, still now. Uh, that's Moana. Moana? Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, yes, I'm actually asking a question for my boyfriend. He's on a student visa right now, and he's supposed to graduate in September, and his OPT was supposed to start then. Do you think those will be affected as well? Um, well, from the reports of the, of the, you know, if we're talking about um, President Trump's tweet, um, it's the rumors that we're hearing is that uh, students would not be affected, um, including those on OPT. However, there could be some surprises we don't know. Um, but I would also mention that it's not, it wouldn't be something likely to be immediate. It would be something with the, with an EO that would be met with a lot of litigation. So that means that it would slow any implementation of it down. Um, but what I will say about um, that OPT time period is you've got to really watch it. Um, and, you know, how much time is being given on that OPT and what the grace period is. Um, uh, to protect any overstays or unlawful presence in the United States. So we can take uh, the last question for now. Uh, so that's, uh, I don't know the, the name of the person, but you just raise your hand. Uh, yes, hi, um, my name is Caroline. Hi, Lorraine. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we do. Oh, good. I have a question. I currently have um, my I-140 in process and they have requested additional um, uh, uh, proof, I guess, that I have to send in. And in the interim, I have um, married. So what happens, um, you know, because I'm looking at the, the additional proof that they're requiring, should I change, am I allowed to change my green card application to, to that of a finish one, or do I have to finish the first one, see what the outcome is, and then reapply? So you have not begun the adjustment as of yet. Is that correct? The adjustment is a second portion of your green card, the I-485. That has not been begun. You just got the RFE, it sounds like, from the I-140. Um, so um, you got to be careful with uh, multiple petitions being filed for the green card. However, um, it, you absolutely can abandon um, the I-140. Um, uh, I, I would want to assess um, the strength of your, and I don't mean to, um, 
say that it's uh, that there's any problem uh, with your marriage petition, but I I would want to first assess um, all the facts and you know the strength of it um, to determine whether or not um, you know you should abandon the um, the the employment based an employment based green card through extraordinary ability even though it's a self petition. So um, and we'd also want to weigh um, the uh, level of difficulty that you, that we're seeing with the RFE that's come out with the 140. So is it a difficult officer? Is it a lenient officer? Where is that sitting? Um, also, I think you should also take into consideration um, the, uh, the fact that in-person interviews um, are uh, suspended. Uh, right now. So, um, so we might want to also look at the timing of either petition and also your goals for the long term of when you want your green card, um, because unfortunately things are delayed for different, for different routes now because of COVID. So it's, I would say, I would love to give you my, um, my exact roadmap map, map for you on what I would recommend. Um, I think we should probably take that offline though, and there there would be more personal questions I'd want to ask before I make my my final kind of recommendations to you on what what I'd want to see there. So, the, but those are some of the issues that I'm pointing out that we'd want to look into. But essentially, um, you 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 can um, look at a marriage petition as well because you're not at this phase right now where you've begun the adjustment portion. Um, but um, again, we'd want to look at a lot of factors there. Okay.